Let's look at drawing, or rather applying constructional techniques to draw a wasp. This is the vile little critter that we will be drawing today. It is a wasp. He is a jerk, or she. I'm not really sure much about how wasps society works, but anyway. There's a few things that we'll be looking at. First off, basic insect anatomy. They have a head, a thorax, and a, uh, an abdomen. Uh, also, we'll be looking at approaches to drawing their legs because they've got quite interesting ones. Although these techniques that we'll talk about will also be applied pretty much across the board. And you'll see what I mean in a bit. And so let's get right into this. I want to try and keep these demos shorter. Um, I'm still hitting like 20 minutes each. Hopefully this one will be shorter. So let's move this one aside. So to start with, we are doing exactly what I said, establishing the head. And keep in mind, here you've got like a very triangular head. We're not worrying about that. We're not worrying about the whole thing. We're not creating a, a form that is going to enclose the head or something like that. If you picture, if you, well, you don't have to picture anything. The wasp is right here. The head that we are drawing, this mass, is really just the smallest space in which you can fit this sphere. When we start talking about animals in the next lesson, this will specifically be it, the uh, cranium, which is a part of the skull. In this case, with insects, we're applying the same concepts. So you've got the cranium onto which we m will definitely be adding additional forms, as we always do when we are constructing. So we're starting it off as simply as possible with this ball because we first just want to establish how it relates to the rest of the body. And then we've got our thorax. I'll just go ahead and put this back here. Which is the part from which the legs come out. In a lot of beetles and things like that, uh, the head and the thorax will be uh, fused. Uh, I believe it's called the cephalothorax when it's both the head and the thorax. Um, you see it in, you know, beetles and various other insects like and arachnids. Uh, it's there in spiders as well. Uh, but anyway, we're not going to worry about that in this demo. So lastly, I'm not actually sure if I mentioned, but the thorax is where all the legs come out from. So some people accidentally put some of them down here, but that's not accurate. They are all coming from the thorax, or at least as far as I know. I could be wrong, but based on all the insects that I've drawn and that I've seen, they generally come out of the thorax. You can think of this as though with a human, uh, if you forget about their legs, you've got the head, You've got their chest, which is another name for the word thorax. We have thoraxes too. And then you've got the abdomen, which is, you know, part of the human body as well. And so if you were to draw this into a person, which is going to be horrifying, we'd still have their arms. This is definitely not going well, but anyway. The point is that they simply have more arms than us, but the construction is still quite similar in terms of at least the parts that are involved. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent and that's only gonna make this video longer. So we've got our major components. Uh, what's next? Center lines are a really important way to ensure that everything stays aligned and so that we better understand how these forms relate to one another. It's pretty often that I see students who 
will either ignore the center line or will actually draw the center line, but without having a sense for how the line is meant to flow over a surface. So if you have two forms that are sitting next to each other, if you draw your center line like this, and you still expect this to be represented as a sphere, not something that is much skinnier, then you're going to run into problems. You need to be mindful of just how this surface is flowing through space and really give it a nice curve to wrap all the way around. So that comes back to the contour lines in lesson two. So make sure that you've practiced them plenty and that you're still working them into your warm-ups because they are critical to really understand how these lines can flow over the surface of a form. And so the center line will also give us a lot of clues as to how various elements should be aligned over the body and just how they are relating to each other, like how the thorax is still centered, I mean, it's still running along the same kind of center as the rest of the body. Now, this is a little bit of a jump, but it can be broken down fairly easily. First, we've added this extra mass, this extra form, in a fairly boxy manner onto the head. The main critical thing with constructing heads is that you have to understand the planes that exist. Here's a top plane, side plane, and then the front plane. Because it's three-dimensional, being able to separate a given form into these different planes can be very helpful. Whereas if we were to get rid of this and just draw a shape like this, we're not really understanding just how it relates to the rest of the forms involved. It still feels fairly three-dimensional, even though this connection here is somewhat curving over the sphere, but you cannot tell which part is, like where the top is separated from the sides. So thinking about things in terms of finding the planes of a, of a form can be very helpful. And working boxier rather than curved can definitely help you out. And so additionally, I did see that here there were certain forms that were present that I wanted to be sure to capture. There's additional mass here, so I caught that here. And I'm always mindful of how these additional forms are actually sitting on what's already present. I'm not simply drawing a shape on top of other flat shapes. I'm being mindful of just how this form is going to wrap around. I'm not drawing it explicitly, but I'm thinking about it as I draw it. I'm not simply going to take a ball and then put another shape on it without consideration for how they exist in 3D space, I'm going to think about how this form wraps around. This is much more similar to the organic intersections in Lesson 2. And so I'm wrapping it around. Down here, I know that there are additional forms here that are probably leading into uh, some interesting configuration on the thorax, and so I'm just trying to lay down more forms to capture that. Again, I'm being pretty light on the additional con construction lines. If you need to add more contour lines to kind of better understand how these forms sit on here, go ahead, but don't go overboard with them. Only add as many as you really require, and try and really think about how these forms are interacting with each other as 3D forms, not just as flat shapes and collections of lines. Here you'll see that I added a pole onto the, uh, this abdomen to really give it a sense of volume. And so if you have a ball, you may still interpret this as a circle, a flat shape, but if you add a pole to it, you can really help convey the idea that there's more to it than that. And so I've also got this contour line and then these wrapping around. And I felt that because this insect actually does have certain natural contour lines, I wanted to make sure that I could take advantage of that. Some of these are more complex, like this, where you've got it kind of dipping inwards, and I don't want to worry about that just yet. 
We'll get to that, but I don't want to complicate things. So for now, I just want to capture a solid form. So always remember, keep things simple as you're building up. At no point do you ever want to add any uh, elements that are too complex for the supports that already exist here. A pretty good example of this, going back to the previous lesson, is actually the idea of people drawing leaves with you know, some sort of edge detail, or even just a simple wavy leaf, before having actually constructed the leaf, the simple leaf shape and establishing how it flows through space before adding that wave. Because now, instead of trying to solve a dozen different problems all at once, you only have to worry about the one at a time. So here we're starting to build out our legs. And in a second, we're going to talk about the specific techniques we use for legs, but these legs themselves are attached to the body with additional forms. So you've got these chunks here, and I wanted to make sure that I gave the proper grounding and could understand just how the legs are going to attach to the rest of the body. And so skipping that step or trying to kind of mush it into the legs themselves would have been a disservice because it would have taken a more complicated problem and tried to tackle it all at once. So first we're just dropping these in and you'll see here how I'm just creating simple balls and mushing them into each other. And it would even help to uh, reinforce that intersection between them with a contour line along the joint. And you'll see me leveraging that a lot more when we actually tackle the legs. Oh, crap. I was on the wrong layer. Okay, well, that's good. So next are our legs. Now, there's a lot to talk about here. And obviously there's a lot that's suddenly gone on the page, but what's actually here is relatively simple. There's just a lot of legs involved. When tackling legs, there's a lot that people have to think about. And it can be a little bit confusing and there can be a lot of experimentation involved. If you look at this section here, there is there are a few things going on. First of all, there's some gesture to it, where it's bending and flowing and there's a rhythm. Additionally, there's a little bit more bulk here in the center than there is out here, so it kind of swells in the middle. That swelling is complexity. It's taking something from the dead simple tube that it would be and now adding an additional element to it. And based on how we approach complexity and construction, we don't want to worry about that right off the bat. So we don't necessarily want to draw something that is capturing that thickness here because that's just more complexity. We want to establish some sort of scaffolding and support for it before we move on to that step. So one thing that a lot of students will do is they will use stretched ellipses, stretched balls, stretched whatever kinds of forms you want to call these, but they're not ideal. And for one reason, because these things are constantly expanding until they reach their peak and then they shrink down again, they're actually quite stiff. There's not a lot of ways that you can take this kind of form, maintain that continual kind of uh, expansion, and still give it a little bit of a bend. When you do, you end up with what is actually going to be the approach that we use here, and that's the sausage forms that we talked about in lesson two. Now, the thing about a sausage is that it is essentially a compound of three forms. 
you've got two balls or spheres. And then you've got a tube. This combination is extremely flexible, can be used to create strong sense of, uh, strong sense of gesture, while also maintaining a strong sense of solidity, which is inherently a little bit conflicting, but we can achieve it quite well using this kind of form. And so as you can see here, I've created each segment out of a simple sausage. It's a cons it maintains a consistent width through its length, and then it only curves out into its balls on the side. The other point to, to uh, keep in mind here is that I'm make sh making sure that they overlap quite a bit. The reason is that these are two different forms and I'm mushing them together and I'm establishing their point of in or their area of intersection with a contour line. The reason I'm doing this is that I don't want to add contour lines to kind of reinforce the solidity of the form out here because that's going to start stiffening things up. Instead, by putting a single contour line right at the joint, I'm providing this whole thing with enough solidity to maintain through its entire length. And so if you remember uh, what I mentioned in previous lessons about not leaving things open-ended and always capping them off, capping something off immediately imbues it with a sense of solidity and three-dimensional form. And that's essentially what's happening here. With these sausages, we have it's not an open form, but it is a flat shape. And we are, right at its where it joins, reinforcing it with the sense of solidity and three-dimensionality. Three and we are establishing these as two different forms that join together, that interact with each other in 3D space. And the fact that they're interacting so clearly in a three-dimensional way goes even further to take that idea of a cap that reinforces the form and pushes it all the way through the, the whole length of these sausages. And I'll imagine that you'll have another one here and you'll do the same thing. So that is an extremely important technique that helps us build solid legs and that's going to apply to insects, it's going to apply to spiders, I mean, not spiders, sorry, to, uh, oh yeah, to arachnids, to animals, and you can even apply it to humans, although, you know, we get a little bit more complicated. But one thing to keep in mind here is that these sausages, because they maintain a consistent width through their lengths, they don't have this extra swelling in the middle. But they, that can be added onto it once you've established this support. So if you draw your sausage, Reinforce the joint. Oh, that's what I'm going on. And then you can actually just take another ball form, add it here. Maybe add a little bit of a contour line or something. That's not a great example. Let's try that again. And so contour lines really help with these intersections because now I can establish just how these forms are mushing together. And so now I've added the, the swelling, as you can see, like over here at the end. These all have these kind of irregular swellings towards the end. You can do it in the middle, and you'll see that I'm doing it with this wasp. So I've added these additional masses where appropriate, and I've kind of blended them back into the form. And I'm always aware of how these things exist in 3D space. The last thing that you want to do 
is lose yourself in the idea that you are drawing a flat set of shapes on a flat piece of paper. You always have to continually think back to how do these forms fit together? How do they exist in 3D space? So the rest that's going on here is really just what I've already done. I'm adding more forms where appropriate to build out these masses. The, uh, the wing itself is a pretty simple flat shape, so I haven't really done much with it. I just built, you know, simple shape and just brought it out. Observation is obviously extremely important to see just how and where all these elements need to fit together. And so you've got like a tiny ball here and these joints, the wing itself is coming out of a section of the thorax. So you really need to keep a close eye on your reference to identify all these elements. Adding antenna. Doing the same thing with the, uh, the little bulges. And this is just detail. So as in previous uh, demos, I'm using a lot of cast shadow shapes to separate my forms. I'm adding this kind of silhouette breaking ribbing to my abdomen. To really convey the idea that these forms are three-dimensional, that they're coming out and they're pushing out into space. I've also got similar information here along the ends of the legs, and so you just need to keep an eye on what is present on your reference. And I'm these little uh, segments back here, they are all layering on. And so I want to really capture that sense here. And so I need to be aware of, once again, I keep saying this like a broken record, how everything fits together in 3D space. And so building this on top of the simpler leg that was present before really helps a great deal. And so that's really it. Um, so obviously this is going to take a great deal of practice. You can't expect to follow along with the demonstration and be able to replicate everything I'm doing here. There's a lot of spatial understanding that you need to develop and then and by doing this, by doing these drawings to whatever level of quality you can, that's how you're going to develop that spatial awareness by trying it out, by getting used to thinking this way and to get and you know, getting a little bit better each time. So Keep at it. Um, once again, there will be a broken down version uh, with text descriptions of what's going on step by step uh, on the Drawbox website. There will be a link in the description below. And so uh, go ahead and check that out and try and follow along with what I'm doing.